to be able to introduce our next speaker, Janice Raymond. Janice has um, inspired so many of us through her, spilt, her talks and through her writing. Her recent um, book, uh, Not a Choice, Not a Job, I know many of us have read. Um, she's the former director of um, the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women. Uh, she's an author of so many books and papers. Winner of the International Award for um, Zero Tolerance Against Violence Against Women in Scotland. I could go on forever, but I could just get out of the way, couldn't I? <laughs> Janice Raymond. Thank you very much, Femi, for, Femi, for that uh, second introduction. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me back a second time. That was very nice of you. Um, I chose to talk about, I think many, many of the organizers at least wondered in the beginning why I chose to talk about the comfort women. And I'd like to just tell you why in the beginning. Um, many of you know that this year is the 70th anniversary of World War II. And there are a lot of celebrations, a lot of events going on in different countries to honor what's called the service and the sacrifice of those who fought in the war. Well, no plans are officially underway to commemorate the hundreds of thousands of women who were drafted into military sexual slavery during that war and who were truly sacrificed. So that's one of the reasons I chose to talk. I also chose to talk about it because the history of the so-called comfort women, and everyone knows that's a euphemism, of course, constitutes one of the most egregious war crimes of the 20th century. But it's never, never been officially recognized as such. And most of these women who were military sexual slaves, uh, most of them are now deceased. But the remnant who have survived and their allies are still trying to pressure Japan to take responsibility for this crime, to apologize and to make reparations. So I'm not only going to talk about Japan today, however, I'm also going to talk about the United States because this, this talk is not only about Japan's war crimes against women in the Second World War, it's also about the US military's reenactment of the comfort women's system during the post-war occupation of Japan. And the drafting of women into military sexual slavery, of course, did not begin with Japan. In the 19th century, the British Army established the cantonment system in India. Uh, that provoked an outraged protest from Josephine Butler. And we could talk about the many, many incidents of military sexual slavery in, in many, many different countries. But the, uh, the comfort woman system is particularly unique. It's unique in several ways. It's unique in the number of women who were subjugated, about 100,000 to 200,000 women during World War II. The methods of procuring those women were highly organized and they were state-sponsored. They ranged from abduction to deception and they spanned the whole reach of Japan's uh, wartime empire in the Asia-Pacific region. Japanese historian uh, Yuki Tanaka has called this crime, quote, the largest and the most elaborate system of trafficking of women in history, and one of the most brutal. 
I'm also tra uh, talking about this today because I think the, the comfort women history, the system, provides a template for other war crimes committed during the 20th and now the 21st century, other war crimes against women. Um, I think it's also uh, a learning uh, course in state-sponsored prostitution today, and I'll talk about that a little more at the end. Of course, much of this is also going on today, um, particularly in the Middle East, where there are hundreds of thousands of young girls and women who remain captive today in Nigeria, in Syria, Iraq, and the Comfort Women campaign also, I think, gives us a lesson in how to exert pressure on countries that have participated in state-sponsored prostitution. In my opinion, what the Comfort Women did in, it, in making public their experiences and in talking about it, and in not only talking about it, but in using their experiences to affect public policy, really is the, the first survivors movement in modern day history uh, that we have. Because they had the courage to speak out against it, to tell the world about it, and then not only to tell their stories, but to try to affect apology and reparations from Japan. Um, who were the comfort women, so-called? 80% of them were from Korea. Beginning with Japan's colonization of Korea in the 1900s, early 1900s, large numbers of Korean women were trafficked to Japan. Um, the Japanese colonial government introduced a licensed prostitution industry also in Korea when it colonized Korea, similar to the one that had already existed in Japan, officially setting up and regulating prostitute employment agencies, and that's what they were called. They were run by both Japanese and Korean procurers, pimps. So they, Jap Japan did it in Japan. They then did it in Korea when they colonized Korea. And in 1932, when they were colonizing, colonizing parts of China, they also did it in parts of China. So they, they had, prior to World War II, they had, they had really established an overseas prostitution industry for their troops, for the most part, in all of those countries. Chinese women were also procured for Japanese military brothels in Japan. Recruiting agents brought Chinese women as they brought Korean women also into Japan. After Japan bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941, the Japanese military authorities set up comfort stations wherever their troops moved in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, my father was stationed on one of those islands during the war with the U.S. Marines. And um, when I began to do this work, and when he began to read about these incidents of, of uh, the, the, the history of the comfort women, which was really made mostly public in the late 1980s and the 1990s, he told me that on the island that he was stationed, he had noted the very unusual presence of, of women, of Asian women, right near the Japanese uh, campsites where, where he was stationed. Uh, other women procured for uh, military sexual slavery came from the Philippines. Taiwan, the Dutch East Indies, which as it was then called, as Indonesia was then called, and China. So from the testimonies of survivors, 
we learn a lot about the different methods of procurement. In Indonesia, where the local population, for example, welcomed the Japanese military as liberators from the Dutch colonialists, deceit was the preferred method. In China and the Philippines, it was kidnapping and abduction. So I'm going to talk about just each of these countries briefly. In the Philippines, it's estimated that Japanese soldiers pressed 1,000 women into sexual servitude during the war. In 1992, uh, a very famous Filipino woman, survivor Maria Rosa Henson, courageously revealed what happened to many Filipino women like her. Encouraged by her testimony, hundreds of other Filipino women who were then living came forward. And she related how the Japanese troops in the Philippines seized women and girls right from the homes and right from streets, followed, of course, by rape and confinement. The average age of Filipinas who was seized was 17, although many were younger than 15. Many of these girls also had to witness the murder of their parents and their siblings at the point that they were also kidnapped. They were kept under guard uh, 24 hours a day, and they were also forced to do all of the manual labor for the troops, like cooking and cleaning, during the day. On average, they were forced to serve 10 Japanese soldiers per day. Many were tortured if they tried to resist, and there are many accounts of resistance in the literature of the survivors. In other countries, the Japanese military didn't directly capture or abduct women, but instead they used recruiters to stock the officially approved so-called comfort stations. Many of these women were, of course, deceived about the real nature of, of their position. Many were told that they owed debts that their parents had paid. This is the testimony of, of Korean survivor Han Sung Yu, who tried to escape. Quote, the proprietor knew he came and beat me all over, saying that he would teach me a lesson once and for all. When my wounds were mostly healed, soldiers began to come looking to have sex with me. I resisted them. So then the proprietor hit me on the, hit me on the head with a club. I can remember blood gushing out from the wound. I blacked out. I was saved because a Western woman living in the neighborhood saw me and bright, brought ointment to put on my wound." Unquote. Many of the testimonies are similar to that, uh, very graphic in terms of what had happened to them. The military tightly controlled each comfort station. And ordinary soldiers, meaning not officers, were allowed to uh, use the women during the daylight hours. During the nighttime hours, officers used the women. On a normal day, women would service 10 men per day, but the number would increase to 30 to 40 before and after battles. There were so-called regulations that mandated condoms for any soldier or any military person who used the stations. But of course, many men refused, forcing the women to serve them. And many of the women uh, testified that they used drugs mixed with alcohol to blunt the abuse and to dull pain. Many also committed suicide. In Indonesia, 20,000 native Indonesian women and a small number of white Dutch women who lived there during the war and who were in some, some way related to the Dutch administrative or, uh, government, um, they were also victims of sexual servitude. And in Indonesia, the Japanese built uh, numerous brothels to serve the 220,000 Japanese military who were stationed in the country. Now, of course, prior to the war, the Dutch colonialists had sexually exploited large numbers of Indonesian women. 
and that was prostitution as usual, as normal. After the war, Dutch authorities conducted an investigation of Japanese war crimes in, in Indonesia. And there was a tribunal, there was a, a country war crimes tribunal, not to be uh, confused with the Tokyo war crimes tribunal that happened after the war. But only those Japanese officers who had conscripted white Dutch women into sexual servitude were prosecuted. None of the others were prosecuted. All, you know, obviously because their own soldiers had abused many Indonesian women to, prior to the war, and the Dutch military authorities viewed the sexual slavery of 20,000 Indonesian women through a racist lens as negligible. When the war ended, most of the comfort women were abandoned and left to fend for themselves. Many women in the so-called comfort stations close to the battlefields died as a result of warfare. Those who, who survived, most of them lived with lifelong illnesses and injuries from the sexual violence. Some were rescued by the Allied forces and sent home, but others were drafted into military sexual slavery when the comfort women system was replicated by the U.S. military during the American occupation of Japan after the war. So what exactly happened after the war? Well, decades after the war, about 20 years after the war, several researchers began to excavate and examine documents that lay in the archives, buried in the archives, of Japan, the United States, and Australia. In spite of Japan's official denial of government sponsorship of military prostitution, many of these records, since they were very well kept, proved that the Japanese authorities institutionalized officially the comfort system during and after the war. However, it took an Asian feminist movement, which was also joined by Japanese feminists, to make visible to the world the plight of the victims of military sexual slavery during World War II. And that Asian feminist movement was inspired by the brave survivors who, at that point, were gradually beginning to testify in public about what had happened to them. In 1981, uh, a very uh, good friend and now, now deceased Japanese feminist journalist, Matsui Ayori, was posted to Singapore, where she met with a woman who had been uh, forced to serve as a comfort woman in, in, during the war. So in 1984, she wrote the first article about what she called the subhuman life of a comfort woman. Matsui's work mocked the first time that anything had appeared in a major global newspaper addressing the issue. She later resigned from the paper to work for women's causes. And in 1998, she founded the Violence Against Women in War Network with the Asia Japan Women's Center, which subsequently organized a mock tribunal in the year 2000 called the Women's International War Crimes Trial that convicted leaders of the comfort women system. Um, if you ever go to Tokyo, I would recommend that she was one of the founders of the Tokyo Women's Active Museum on War and Peace. And she, she co-founded this because she felt that what was happening in Japan after the war was a total re re revisionist history of the war. And so in order to, to preserve the memory and the history of what really had happened, the wartime violence that really had been committed by the Japanese military against women, 
um, she helped to found that museum. The group that has really led international efforts, and they're still leading international efforts, to pressure Japan into accepting legal responsibility for this crime uh, and for paying compensation to the survivors is the Korean women's movement. In 1991, there were three, there were three Korean survivors who filed a class action suit on behalf of themselves and other Korean women. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, most of the women, of over 100,000 women were, who were drafted into military sexual slavery came from Korea. So these women, uh, after 50 years of anonymity, uh, privation, and an experience, of course, that produced shame and fear of revelation, those survivors, now advanced in age, told their stories. And Yi Young Yo was one of them. Quote, she said, the Japanese occupied our country and abused us. I want them to compensate us for the sacrifices we were forced to make. They took us completely under their control, but now they are making feeble excuses about the recruitment of the comfort women. And they say that we volunteered. It was their politics that drove us to the place of our deaths. I want to tell the Japanese government that they must not evade the issue any longer. A Korean NGO was, was formed in the aftermath of, of that statement in those, the survivors' class action suit. And it was called the Korean Council for the Women Drafted for Military Sexual Slavery by Japan quite a long title. Um, they appealed to what was at that point the UN Commission on Human Rights. And they appealed to the UN, and this was, don't forget, in the 1990s, so this was a long time after what had happened. But they appealed to the, to the UN Commission on Human Rights to investigate the comfort women's situation and Japan's responsibility and to take some position on this. So, in 1995, Japan set up a fund to compensate the victims. But it wasn't a direct fund. It was an arrangement that was essentially an end run around any admission, of, any official admission of guilt and responsibility. Because the funds were to be administered not by the government, but through an intermediary approach called the Asian Women's Fund. Sounds like a women's organization, but it wasn't. It was an organization that was set up by the Japanese government to dispense uh, payments to each individual survivor who registered in countries from which the women were drafted. So the Korean Council, the NGO that uh, appeal to the UN to investigate the comfort women's situation. The Korean Council and its international allies were opposed to accepting Asian women's fund money because they viewed it as a governmental tactic to sidestep moral responsibility, official accountability, and any straightforward statement about the victims. Now this was very complicated because survivors took varying positions on this. Many were aging, many were dying, and they needed the money. Uh, for example, Maria Rosa Henson, the Filipina woman who I quoted earlier, was among the first to come forward to accept the money. Whereas Kim Hak Sun, one of the Korean women who brought, who brought the uh, civil action, the action suit, the court action suit against uh, Japan, um, refused to accept the money. She died, unfortunately, in 1997. Uh, four of the Filipinas who chose to accept payment from the Asian Women's Fund said that although they took the payment, they wanted more than compensation. One stated, they ruined our lives as women, 
My eldest sister, she lost her mind because of the trauma. Um, Philippine survivor, uh, Lila Pilipina, who was the leader of the Philippine Survivors Movement, said she was still hopeful that justice would be served. But she added, quote, what I'm only afraid of, we are running out of time. By 2015, this year, Korean survivors have dwindled to 50. So there are 50 of them left with an average age of 89. The surviving Korean uh, women, however, are still um, demanding and seeking admission of legal responsibility from Japan. And many of them who are still, uh, who are still able to travel have traveled this year, at least in the United States, particularly because, and I'm going to get into that in a, in a minute, particularly because, because Japan is, revive, is trying to revive its economic and its military position with the United States. And the Japanese Prime Minister has appeared uh, at our Congress um, asking for um, congressional support for a military budget. And the survivors have targeted uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, wherever he goes, wherever he appears in the United States. But I'll talk about that in just a second. I want to get, first of all, to the United States and what was the role of the United States in the post-war occupation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the comfort women. Um, a lot of people have heard about the comfort women situation, but very, I find very few know about the role of the United States and its allies in, in post-war Japan. Um, the Japanese surrendered, depending upon what time zone you're in, on August 15th. And right away, the Japanese government was fearful that what they called uh, sex-starved U.S. occupation troops would behave as did their Japanese forces abroad. So the government, through a Japanese agency that was set up by the government, recruited thousands of Japanese women to serve foreign soldiers in officially established brothels throughout Japan wherever the U.S. Uh, forces were. The women who were pressed into service were told that their mission was to be, quote, a sexual dyke, D-I-K-E, to protect the chastity of Japanese women and to prevent pollution of the race. Now, if you read official police accounts, they maintained that Japanese comfort women were all professional licensed prostitutes. That is not true. Um, the authorities could only fill the brothels by advertising for women who would, quote, serve their country. And a similar thing was done in Korea during the U.S. Uh, post-war occupation there with Korean women. So a typical ad, for example, would read, we require the utmost cooperation of new Japanese women who participate in a great project to comfort the occupation forces. Accommodation, clothes, and meals are all free. So there were many women who were brought in through advertisements, but they had no idea of what awaited them. Many of the Japanese women who enlisted or were eventually drafted were war orphans. They were widows who were also starving and homeless. Some of them were high school students who during the war were drafted into the munitions factories uh, in Japan. Many of them had lost their families and had nowhere else to go. Some were women who were raped by US soldiers at the end of the war. And still others were returning women who had earlier been conscripted into wartime comfort stations by the Japanese in various parts of the Asia Pacific. Japanese politicians had no compunction about segregating a group of disposable women from the general female population. 
allegedly to serve and protect women who weren't so expendable. The comfort facilities, as they were called, same name, were made available only to the occupation forces, who were mostly from the United States, along with 40,000 troops from Britain and British Commonwealth countries. Japanese men were banned from the premises. So what was the specific role of the US military in post-war occupation and the prostitution system? Well, from the very beginning, and I mean from the very beginning, from the very first week that Makata landed in Japan, the US occupation authorities were prepared not only to tolerate organized prostitution, but also to organize it in ways that would accommodate the troops. US Army officers inspected the red light districts. They set up prophylactic stations for the troops, not for the women. U.S. military police were commanded to keep order among the lines of U.S. soldiers waiting their turns to enter the brothels. And in the beginning, they could hardly control the throngs of men who lined up to be sexually served. Despite reports that women were being coerced into the occupation brothels, and with full knowledge of Japan's appalling conscription of women into military sexual slavery during the war, US soldiers found an officially sanctioned system of brothels in Japan waiting for them almost immediately when they entered the country. Each woman had to service 15 to 60 buyers a day. Both the Japanese and the U.S. authorities treated prostitution as a necessary amenity for the warriors. So at its peak, 70,000 women ended up serving 350,000 occupation troops in the post-war period. And I, when I say the post-war period, I mean over a period of two years. The number uh, the occupation lasted longer than two years, but I'll come to this. The number of unofficial private brothels also was very high. It was probably even higher than the licensed brothels. Uh, the U.S. military's collusion with the Japanese gov uh, government meant that they also, our, our doctors, inspected women for venereal disease. Um, they, uh, they supervised many of those brothels, the military police did, and they obviously replicated the whole comfort women system. Uh, about a year after um, all of this happened, at the instigation of US military chaplains, General Makatha was pressured to put an end to the military's use of comfort stations, and to put them off limits, and to re relocate women who had passed, who had been passed down from the Japanese troops to the Americans. Um, all violations of this policy were subject to disciplinary action. But by that time, um, by, by the time that that edict went into effect, many of the prostituted women were, were dead. Many of them also had venereal disease, and many of them were put out on the street. More than a quarter of all of the US military servicemen in Japan also had a sexually transmitted disease. So obviously, um, more than a quarter of the men were involved in the prostituting of women. Um, so, the so we come to, um, the 1949 um, and the post-war post period. And we have the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal that was held to prosecute Japanese war crimes. It was the counterpart of the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Um, those crimes against the comfort women 
against the hundreds of thousands of women who were drafted into military sexual slavery were never prosecuted. Uh, U.S. military authorities controlled, of course, the, the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal. And they were well aware of these crimes against women. They held key positions of power during the tribunal. And of course, it, I think it is fairly obvious that the tribunal did not prosecute those crimes against the comfort women because the U.S. occupation authorities did not want their own comfort women system exposed. And uh, there's a lot of good historical documents uh, um, revealing that. Obviously, the fact that it was mostly Asian women who were violated by both Japanese and the Americans added to the United States' lack of accountability. So, what is happening now? Japan is still enormously divided over the comfort women issue. Depending on who is prime minister in Japan, the Japanese government makes some attempts to acknowledge the issue, but then within the next government takes it back. Um, there has been a steady stream of governmental intervention into eliminating information from school textbooks, sanitizing the brutal exploitation of hundreds of thousands of women uh, during the war. But most recently, the Japanese government is targeting the work of historians, not only within Japan, but also abroad. Several of my friends who are historians in the United States who are working on this issue um, have been targeted to revise certain publications. The language of comfort women or comfort stations, of course, are euphemisms that are used by the military to mask the brutality and to make it sound like this was a voluntary service that women were performing. In 2007, uh, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, during his first time as Prime Minister, in a very regressive public statement, announced that there was absolutely no evidence that the Imperial Japanese Army had conscripted hundreds of thousands of mostly Asian women into military brothels during World War II. That was in 2007. And also in 2007, Abe's statement was followed by a full-page ad in the Washington Post, one of our major newspapers. It was signed by a group of Japanese lawmakers who wanted, quote, to share the truth with the American people, unquote. So the truth, quote, unquote, was, that no historical document proves that these women were forced, but rather the, the ad alleged that, quote, they were embedded with the Japanese army, working under a system of licensed prostitution that was commonplace around the world at the time. So the ad acknowledged some little small breakdowns in discipline, but it also asserted that many of these women made more money than field offices and generals. So Abe is prime minister in 2007. He gets re-elected um, a couple of years ago. So this year he visits Washington in his second term of prime minister as I said earlier, an attempt to solidify Japan's economic and military relationship with the United States. So uh, there have been big campaigns, uh, mostly again organized by the Korean organization in concert with allied organizations in the United States to pressure Abe to make a public apology and to take official responsibility for this crime. Um, so he came, once more he evaded a direct responsibility and apology, and this is what he said. 
He oozed. I am deeply pained to think about the comfort women who experienced immeasurable pain and suffering due to human trafficking. That was it. No reference to the Japanese government, no reference to the Japanese military that engaged in the trafficking, no reference to those who were responsible for the sexual slavery of hundreds of thousands of Asian women. Then again, in August of this year, commemorating the end of the war on, uh, the, on the anniversary of Japan's surrender, Abe offered only an indirect statement, again avoiding an apology and an assumption of any official responsibility for the crimes committed. He said, quote, we must never forget that there were women behind the battlefields whose honor and dignity were severely injured. But he attributed no blame for the injuries. He went further in stating, quote, we must not let our children, grandchildren, and even further generations to come, who have nothing to do with that war, be predestined to apologize, unquote. Um, I just say in, in, in passing here that Abe is a member of the Conservative Party in Japan who have long sought to revise the history of Japan's role in World War II and especially to avoid what they, what they call a, masochist, a masochistic history, to, a masochistic approach to Japan's history. Um, my organization, the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women, has worked recently with Korean organizations to urge Abe to make this official apology, specifying Japan's role in drafting hundreds of thousands of women and girls into sexual slavery during World War II. Um, there is a petition on change.org that has been signed at this point by over 40,000 people, and you can certainly join that petition uh, as, as one thing that it is possible to, to do. Um, so, coming to the end of, of what I want to say about this, I think the history of the comfort women system is timely because it reverberates with lessons about state-sponsored prostitution today. I think for many people it's easier, or it may be easier, to comprehend that meaningful consent does not exist within a military context where you have women of one country used in prostitution by the dominant country. It's easier to understand that than it is to understand that in a modern democratic government which legalizes or decriminalizes the sex industry, it's the same thing. And I think that part of that is because those countries, these legalizing or decriminalizing countries like Australia, uh, the Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, they draw a line in the sand between voluntary and forced prostitution. And they base their systems of sexual exploitation on that line in the sand. A line in the sand that they think is so absolute. And I think it's, it's been very convincing because people are not so ready to understand the harm to women of modern state-sponsored prostitution regimes. They don't understand, for example, that in a non-military context, governments can just as well be persuasive promoters of prostitution as in a military context. In countries that have legalized or decriminalized systems of prostitution, those countries become prostitution nations in which women are encouraged to prostitute because it is legal. And men are given legal permission to buy women because it is legal. And pimps who prey on the vulnerabilities of women and children are transformed into acceptable business agents overnight. Those countries justify not only the creators of the prostitution system and its crimes against women, but also the hundreds of thousands of ordinary men who use and abuse prostituted women. 
The Japanese government has tried to do the same thing. It has tried to whitewash its conscription of women into military prostitution by alleging that women were embedded within a system of legal prostitution that made distinctions between those women who were forced and those women who made the alleged choice. The Netherlands, Germany, and Australia used the same reasoning. In 1952, another prominent Japanese historian, Yanahira Tadeo, stated that the consequences of the post-war, the U.S. post-war sexual exploitation of women had affected Japanese society no less, he said, than the destructive power of the A-bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And what he meant was that state-sponsored prostitution had corrupted Japanese society, both morally and economically. Not only when the post-war brothels were set up for the US and other allied occupation troops, but also when Japan became the center for US and Australian forces who took their r and in Japan during the Korean War. So you have the US post-war occupation, and then they, you have the U.S. and other troops coming into Japan during the Korean War for R&R. &R. And he said that the high taxes that were levied, levied on the Japanese sex industry played a key role in raising public money for the rebuilding of Japan and in constructing the economic infrastructure of Japanese capitalism after the war. The same economic infrastructure that governments are replicating through legalized, sanctioned prostitution of women in state-sponsored regimes such as the Netherlands, where prostitution accounts for 5% of the gross domestic product. So I end with saying that militarism is a radical feminist issue. Militarism is just as horrific today as it was during World War II. And the US bears immense responsibility for this, especially in the Middle East, which is now broken apart by war and war crimes against women. Several years ago, I worked with a group of women um, who had organized a four-year project in the Middle East 